I was just talking for 10 minutes and the recorder was not on. I hate having to redo. All right, I'm gonna uh, cover the Sunday uh, message from both Church Unlimited, Pastor Bill Cornelius, and from the Sunday Mass, which I listen to on the radio. And I'm by, I'm by the water, where I live. I live right over there. Uh, so, my daughter's out of town with my son-in-law. They did like a little, I think my son-in-law, he likes going to those monster truck things. You know, you drive the trucks, you've got a monster truck in the mud and all. I think they did something like that up in Austin. She should be back uh, today. So I figured I'd do a little uh, talk on the verses. Um, from the Mass, it was a, a chapter I talk about a lot. It was from Hebrews chapter 11. The priest who was speaking uh, was part of a uh, missionary outreach to India. He now lives, uh, I just listened to him say it, he now lives in Houston, but he would, did a lot of work, I believe it was India, and then he was sharing from Hebrews 11, and talking about Abraham, which I've taught a lot, and so but the theme would have been faith, Abraham in Hebrews 11, we read, God made the promise to Abraham that uh, if he offered uh, through Abraham, Oh, I forgot to go to you another story. Through Abraham, God would bless all of the world if Abraham walked by faith. You believe me, Abraham, get out of your country, from your kindred, from your father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make it be a great nation. I will bless those who bless you, I will curse him who curses you, and through your seed, offspring, shall all of the families of the whole earth be blessed. And that was the beginning of the journey. It's a land promise, give you all the land and I'll give you a bunch of seed. I walked the bridge the other day, but it'd be too windy to do that and make a video. So the priest spoke on that. We read that story repeated in the New Testament letter of Hebrews. And it says, which is the great faith chapter, how all of the patriarchs, all of matriarchs as well, if you want to call Rahab the harlot, that those are examples of people that had faith. One was the one I just mentioned. Rahab, we read about her in the book of Joshua. She was one of the residents of Jericho, the first city that the people of God would conquer when they came into the land of Canaan the beginning of the book of Joshua. So she took in the spies. And her story is given in Hebrews 11. Because she hid them. And she believed that God was going to give the city of Jericho, famous city, walls fallen down. But she believed that God was going to fulfill his promise and give that land, the land of Canaan, to the children of Israel. So she's mentioned in Hebrews 11 because she had faith. It says, by faith she received the spies with peace. So, Hebrews 11 talks about the story of Abraham, and the part we see the priest spoke of was God at one point in the story of Abraham in Genesis, chapter 22. Key chapters, Genesis 12, 15, 17, 18, 22. You get the whole story, all the promises there. So uh, Hebrews 11 says, And when God asked, told Abraham, Offer up your son, Isaac, your only son, the one that the promise would be fulfilled through, that you're going to have all these children through Isaac, the promised son. But God said one day, Offer him, Mount Moriah. And by faith it says, He went to offer up his son, Isaac. If God said to Abraham, which he did, that Isaac is the promised son that I gave to you, with Abraham, when you were 100 and Sarah was 90 years old, and you already had another son by the name of Ishmael, that was about 12 years old at the time, but you had her from the handmaiden Hagar. 
Paul talks about her in Galatians. I might do a lot today, I don't know. But that promise was going to come through Isaac. But how could Abraham offer up Isaac on the altar? Hebrews 11 says, he just figured, Abraham just figured, I received this boy Isaac like from the dead because I was a hundred, Sarah was ninety, and you got her and she got pregnant. And it was really a great thing that she would have gotten pregnant at that age. So Abraham just figured, God's telling me to offer up my son Isaac, but the same God told me through Isaac I will have a whole bunch of people. And it says in Hebrews 11, Abraham convinced himself, I guess God will just raise that boy from the dead. Because I know this one promise he made, that through Isaac, I'm going to have all these family, all these offspring. And the other thing he said was offer him. And so instead of Abraham trying to figure out this thing, this contradiction, he says, I'm not going to try and figure it out. I've learned at this stage in my life, at the age Abraham was, he said, I learned to just obey. I learned to just obey and not try to make the plan. And so Hebrews 11 says, he believed in his own mind that God would raise him from the dead. Why is it so important that that test was given? Isaac is a type and a picture of Jesus Christ. And that God the Father would offer up his son on a cross. And you know, Calvary and, and Moriah, if I'm remembering correctly, are the same mountain which is a great song, where Isaac was, Abraham was going to offer him. But in order for Abraham to fulfill the type, picture, and symbol of God the Father, he had to have believed that his son would be raised from the dead. He had to, God had to, quote, figure out a scenario where Abraham would come to faith to believe that if he offered his son, he would be raised from the dead. And most of us think it was just a simple test. Look, in the mind of God, who knows everything, this test was required. And you say, well then how could God have come up with some type of a quote scheme to cause Abraham to believe that his son would be raised from the dead? That's how. He would wait until the time in Abraham's life where he was so attuned to the voice of God and attuned to being obedient to that voice that this test could be given because if he said to Abraham offer your son and Abraham at that stage said no no this is the one that the promise is from surely this must not be God's voice then the, then this story wouldn't work so God had to basically wait and to a time of his life, maybe Abraham thought, because he had to wait for the promised child a long time. And why couldn't God give him the promised child when he was 70-something? Before he came up, Abraham came up with other schemes, how God would fulfill that promise. Because God was, I think, waiting for Abraham to finally believe, to finally learn through experience that if God says it, I'm going to do it. And it took that long to fulfill the type and picture. Now the priest didn't get into all that, but that was the story. Now, <clears throat> Pastor Bill talked about, it's his first week back, he was on vacation for about a month, and they did a lot of those movies, which I was speaking about. And it was the same thing, uh, same story. Really, the theme was have faith. So they fit. It came, the story came from uh, Mark 5, and it's the famous story of Jesus healing the dead girl. She was sick, then she dies, and she was 12 years old. I told it before. A couple of interesting things. You'll notice that in the story, when Jesus actually raises this girl from the dead, it says, he told his disciples, don't tell anybody about it. You know, we read him doing that a lot. And, and some critics of Christianity say Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. 
Jesus. They're wrong because he did. In John's Gospel, they'll actually, which I'm teaching, they'll actually ask him, are you the one or not? Quit making us wonder. And he says, I already told you I'm the one. Jesus says that in John's Gospel, which I'm teaching at this season. But some of the critics say he didn't claim it because what you find in the life of Jesus, as he's given us an example of how we're going to do it when he's gone, you see a lack of self-promotion. And I think the reason he gave these examples where he said, as soon as he healed, as soon as he raised the girl from dead, he said, and don't tell anybody. I think he wanted to instill within his men, when, I, when, when he leaves and he gives us the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit will work in us, but the character had to be, you don't promote yourself, you don't fall into that. The New Testament says, if a man's going to be in a position of leadership, he can't be a novice, lest he falls into the snare and the temptation of the devil, which is, all of a sudden, it's not about the divine perspective, it's about you operating in the gift. And so, in order for the gifts to be fully released within our lives, an aspect is the character where you don't self-promote. You know, in John, uh, the next chapter I teach, you know, a little series on John's Gospel, get a good view for you. If I title this video, oh, I don't know, something like, I found a verse in the Bible where Jesus said, if you do not do this, you go to hell, for sure, for sure. And if you want to go to heaven, you must do this. I mean, I actually read it yesterday. It's not new to me. But when I read these, it makes me think, what do we... What is it, John? Say if I told you I found a verse where Paul said, if you do not get baptized in the name of Jesus only, these are all debates. Say if I found a verse. Oh, it was hidden, guys. It's there in Galatians. It's in the book of... If you do not get baptized in the name of Jesus, thou shalt go to hell. And it's right there. Galatians something or Hebrews something. Or Peter said it. Or James in his letter wrote, you must be baptized in this name. You must do that or you will go to hell. And if we found it, and it was missing, but it's in there. Oh, how it would rattle us, even if I titled the video this. But do you know there's so many statements from Jesus? And the one I was just thinking of is this. He says, If you do not hate your life in this world, you're going you're gonna to lose it. But if you hate your life in this world, you will save it until life eternal. Okay, if you don't hate your life in this world, you go to hell. But if you want to go to heaven, if you want eternal life, the great gospel on eternal life, John's gospel, you must hate this life in this world, and then you save it. Then you have it for eternal life. Now, most of you know that, and most of you scholars that watch. You say, oh, John, we know that one. But let me, let me challenge you. Do you take those statements from Jesus as serious if I found one where Paul said, if you don't get baptized a certain way, you go to hell. If you don't, because those other ones in the book of Acts and New Testament, which I'm familiar with them all, we take them serious. We, you know, whole denominations are built on a few statements from Paul, Peter, and James and different guys. You say, well, but we believe in the inspiration. Yes, I believe in the inspiration scripture. You know, at the end of the Gospels, Jesus says, Go into all the world and teach them the things I do. I wonder. We seem to go in all the world and we... Look, I believe in the inspiration of Scripture. I te I'm teaching the whole New Testament. But I think we go into all the world and we teach them everything we read about that Paul wrote. That's inspired, granted. We teach them everything in the letter of Peter, everything in the Old Testament. But just think of that statement. Jesus says, look guys, I send you out in all the world. Teach them 
the things I taught you. To obey the things I taught you. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you get hit on one side, turn the other cheek. Teach them those principles. I wonder if we take the words of Jesus even half as serious as the other inspired scriptures of the New Testament. Because I just quoted you one. And I think if we read Paul saying to one of the churches, unless you hate your life in this world, you will not be saved. But if you want to be saved, church at Corinth or Galatia, or you must hate your life in this world. I think we take it more serious. That's an indictment on us. That's an indictment on us. What do you think that first means? I think it means what it says. How about that? I found a fork. I think it means what it says. Uh, let's see. Forget who it was. It's a famous... I think it's a Renaissance painting. But it's famous painting. Oh, it might be... I don't know if it's Dante or not, okay? It might be Dante. But it's somebody with a, a famous painter, artist. But the picture of hell was everybody, I think it was Forks, but they couldn't, everybody had the, if I got it right, this story's still good. They're all sitting around, but the Forks are real long. And how could that be hell? Because they couldn't feed themselves. But they're in hell because they're so selfish they'd never feed anybody else. They'd be able to have survived if they were not so selfish. Because you could feed the other guy across, but no, everything's about them. That's the fork. Oh. So, being faithful to do the Church Unlimited outline and to do uh, the Mass, and I had a little time. I forgot, I want to get off of my purse, but I missed the exit. How do you miss the exit? I know. You know, there's an... The guy, Alan, Apostle Alan, the homeless guy I mentioned a few weeks ago, he kind of camps out here. Look, Alan's crow was on the videos where I was talking about Alan. And then the next day, we're at Timmins, and uh, Crow, and I was with Crow. And Crow says to me, and look, I was speaking of Alan. He's a homeless apostle living here for many years. Uh, and I know a lot, you know, many years I've known Alan. And Crow comes out of the mission and he says to me, was that Alan in there, John? Now, I didn't go in Timmins that day or at that moment. And I said, Alan? I said, I don't know any Alan. I said, I, I, I cause I'm thinking... Are any of my street friends named Alan? And I'm, oh, I'm thinking of Alan's from high school when I was a kid. Like, I'm going back that far. I don't know any Alan's. And, you know, Crow looked strange at me. Like, either, maybe, you know, I'm sure the other guys have told him. You know, John sometimes, maybe when he's teaching, he seems like he's all right. Maybe they said, but, you know, John sometimes loses a little bit of his mine <laughs> and I'm wondering if Crow thought that because Alan sleeps here that might even be his clothes but I'm wondering because Crow looked funny at me not that he doubted me but I think maybe he thought oh you know John might actually have some problems and then I remembered I said Alan who he said well the older man that you just talked about like yesterday <laughs> on the video I spoke about Alan I said oh I'm sorry uh, I couldn't remember. I don't know if it was Alan. I said later, I said, oh, it might have been him crowing because it would be good for you to talk to him because look, Alan lives right here. I just showed you, that's one of his camp spots right there. God's going to do things in your life and it's not contingent upon you to have your act together. Because God's glorified when you get to a stage like Abraham where you don't try to figure it out no more. He said, 
you got the plan of your ministry, you got the plan of everything you want to do. When you get to a stage in your life where you say, I can't, I, I can't work a plan anymore. I can't remember Alan. When you get to a stage in your life where you just say, I'm going to just obey what you tell me. That's it. That's ministry. Jesus said there were 12 hours in the day. He said, walk where you have the day. Just walk when I speak to you. Walk when the Father communes. Jesus said in John's Gospel, As the Father knows me, so I know the Father. As the Father knows me, that's how I know him. That's why in John's Gospel, you almost see a rudeness of Jesus when they want to support him. He says he would not commit himself to any. The more he began to know God, the Father, I believe in the deity, okay? I'm just saying that statement was, as the Father knows me, this is now I'm beginning to know Him in the earthly walk. This is for all of us. And then there's a great distancing from all the things you see. Because even though people mean well, you begin seeing not only how there's so much fakeness, it's in you and everybody. You begin seeing the condition, the real condition. By God's grace, He makes us into His image. We're being renewed. But Paul, as you continue to read the letters of the New Testament, he goes from he's a sinner to, and the later letters, the worst sinner. The more he saw God, the more he understood himself, the great apostle. So I want to do a nice little video. I'd like to walk, when I walked the bridge, I walked it the other day. Angel, sweet angel, who I do the, I used to do the halfway house with angel. They saw me walking over the bridge and they turned around. I was parked right there. Oh, John, are you okay? I talk to myself when I walk, okay? You might see me walking like this without a camera laughing. I said, oh, angel, they stopped. They thought maybe my car broke down. I said, no, I'm all right. I, I always kid them. She was with Jesse. They just got married officially Friday. They invited me. I, I couldn't make it. I said, no, but next time you can just bring me two tacos. And Jesse laughs. Jesse likes my jokes. That's really what's the most important that you guys laugh at the joke. So anyway, it was right here. I was coming over the bridge. All right. So that'll be, that was the theme from the Mass, Hebrews 11. And Bill's sermon. That was really what it was about, faith. Believe it. Okay. And look, Rahab the harlot, who I mentioned a little bit, she's considered one of the great heroes of the faith. With the past like that, yes, yes, you can believe whenever you want in your life. Mary, we were just talking about in the gospel, wash Jesus' feet, perfume, tears. He says, those who have forgiven much, they love much. So just want to end with that. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and give you. The Lord be gracious unto you and the Lord give you peace.